Hello, I'm Robert and I'm going to talk about why we have found out so little about Mars and yet why there is so much interest in the planet. There are certain basic things about Mars that we simply don't know the answer and especially there's nobody has a clue, nobody has any idea about whether there ever has been life on Mars and whether there is life now. A really fundamental question about the planet. And uh, other really rather basic things like whether water used to flow on Mars in the past. And this was the result of several decades research before we knew for sure that it's now pretty convincingly demonstrated. And it was rather exciting for the researchers to find this and finally confirm this because it has been such a long and difficult search to find out whether water did a, a flow on Mars in the past. This is now known, but it's not yet known if uh, Mars ever had life or has life now. And so you might wonder, if you sent an explorer to a rover to the Earth, then you would find out straight away that there's life on the Earth and you would see water and everything and it would be a very easy discovery to make. Indeed, you wouldn't even need to send anything to the Earth. If you saw the Earth from the distance of, the, of Mars, you would easily be able to deduce that there is life on Earth. And this is Mars as we see it from Earth. And in, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, they actually thought that th these images, obviously not as good as this, this is a Hubble Space Telescope picture, but the pictures they saw of the of Mars, they thought that it looked quite habitable in their in their telescopes. So you see the polar ice caps there. Uh, the white thing to the right is a cloud. There's a little bit of white to the right, but the top and bottom you have the polar ice caps. I think a bit of cloud there as well. And then the darker regions, then these were interpreted as vegetation because they change seasonally. And it looks very like a desert landscape. Obviously Mars has to be colder than the Earth, they knew that because it's further away from the Sun. But it was thought it was still easily warm enough to be habitable. And so it does, it indeed, it looks like a desert landscape and it looks quite habitable. And you might think, well, okay, you've got to pull the ice caps to the rest of it, it's surely uh, at least warm enough to be habitable. But if you ask about the temperature of Mars, the results about that is actually quite surprising as to how very cold Mars is. It's far, far colder, probably, than you would guess if you don't know the answer. So obviously it's colder than the Sahara Desert, it's colder than the Atacama Desert, and uh, it's colder even if you think about Siberia and the very northern Arctic regions of Canada, well Mars is colder than that. And I'm not talking about the polar regions of Mars, I'm talking about the equatorial regions of Mars. And I'm talking about the average temperatures because you have extreme swings between day and night. The average temperatures in the equator on Mars are roughly equivalent to the interior of the Antarctica, the coldest place on Earth. And so this is a bit of a question. Why does it, why isn't it covered in ice then? Because if it is cold as Antarctica, if it was anything like the Earth, it would be entirely covered in ice. The, you may know that, again that Earth went through phases uh, billions of years ago called Snowball Earth. And this is fairly conclusively believed now. It was controversial again for a while. And when this happens, then the oceans completely freeze over and the land is covered in, in, in glaciers and it just looks like a white snowball from, from space. So why doesn't Mars, why don't we have Snowball Mars? Why is Mars red and why isn't it white? And so that's a fundamental question. And again, we don't really know entirely why that is, actually. 
the mystery there is that part of the reason is because Mars has got uh, much less water, it's believed, or ice as it is now, than the Earth. But that's a surprise because Mars is formed further away from the Sun. And according to the models of how, how the planets formed, then the inner planets should be much drier and the outer ones should be the ones that have the more ice and water and then ice as you get further out. But Mars rather bucks the trend because water is the, Earth is the one with lots of water and our seas are very deep and we have far more water compared to the mass on Earth than you have on Mars. And the answer, the reason why that is, isn't fully understood. There's uh, one possibility, it's probably the leading contender, I imagine, is that the early solar system, the planets, were formed from icy planet, from planetesimals, which are sort of smaller proto-embryo planets. And these smashed together to create the bigger planets. And it's thought that perhaps the Earth's oceans are partly derived from planetesimals that formed outside of the Mars orbit, even further away than Mars, so they were icy bodies, and they may have smashed into the early Earth, and maybe Earth was an easier target, being having a somewhat smaller orbit and closer to the Sun, and if for whatever reason they seem to have missed Mars and hit Earth. But that's just one hypothesis we don't know for sure. So that could be part of the explanation, that there simply isn't very much water, ice on Mars, but nevertheless it's known that there's quite a lot of ice on Mars, even if not as, quite as much as you would expect compared with the Earth. And so there's another reason why it is so, so, very, um, so very little ice on the surface, and this is because the, of its atmosphere is so thin. You may have heard of the Armstrong limit, and the Armstrong limit is the absolute lowest pressure that a human being possibly could survive, because it's the temperature, the pressure, at atmospheric pressure below which water boils at blood temperature, and that means your blood actually wouldn't boil because it's enclosed in capillaries and so forth, but the your saliva would boil and the moisture on the inside of your lungs would boil below the Armstrong limit. And you absolutely have to have wear a full spacesuit at those low pressures. Well, the atmospheric pressure on Mars is well below the Armstrong limit. I'm talking about ground level atmospheric pressure on Mars. And it's 0.6%, not the 6%, of the Armstrong limit, but 0.6%. It's about the tenth of the Armstrong limit. Some areas of Mars, the atmospheric pressure is a little bit higher than that. For instance, the floor of the Hellas Basin. And there, the boiling point of water, it's well below uh, blood temperature, but it's a few degrees centigrade. And this means that liquid water could form briefly on the floor of the Hellas crater. But it's, the temperature is very close to boiling point. And just as when you put out your clothes on a sunny day, uh, they dry out, and the water in the clothes doesn't have to reach boiling point for them to dry out. It just evaporates in the heat. So in the same way, on Mars, if it's even just a water that has just melted, even in the deepest places, it's very close to boiling point and it will evaporate very quickly. Intriguingly, you actually will, there's observations of mists on the floors of the Hellas crater. So one possibility is that perhaps liquid water does form down there and then evaporates and forms these mists very rapidly, just as in this picture. It's a little bit controversial, that. But whatever, that means that uh, that is part of the reason why Mars is, has the, uh, is 
as the ice only at the poles, but it's not enough of a reason, because remember that it's so cold that you would expect there to be ice all over the surface rather than water. But the ice over most of the surface of Mars, then the atmospheric pressure is so low that ice immediately turns into water vapour. It's like the ice boils, as it were, except it's called subliming when it's a solid that turns straight into water, into, into a gas. And it's like dry ice, which turns into carbon dioxide gas, and it sublimes directly into carbon dioxide gas. So over the or most of the surface of Mars, except at the poles, ice on the surface would simply sublime directly into the atmosphere. And this dries out the surface. And in the equatorial regions of Mars, in fact, there's another process that happens over geological time, that just as uh, your clothes dry out on a dry day well below boiling point, then well below the point that ice sublimes, ice will still slowly evaporate into the atmosphere and this process penetrates deep deep below the surface in the equatorial regions of Mars and even tens and hundreds of meters below the surface so where Curiosity is at present this is quite close to the equator it's extremely dry <coughs> there is some observation from orbit which suggests that there may be subsurface ice well below the surface in the equatorial regions in places. If that is the case, then it must have got trapped on the way to the surface. The way it works is that it gradually migrates upwards. It sublimes, then it would condense again, sublime, condense, all the way up until it reaches the surface and, dry, and it, that's how it dries out. So it's a combination of those two, the drying out of the, the ice subliming and not being uh, as much as there was on Earth to start with, and the atmosphere is so very thin. So we can see that Mars is extremely inhospitable for life, and it's perhaps not too much of a surprise that we haven't discovered life yet on the surface. What's a little bit more surprising is that there's some hope that there's life on the surface, and we'll come to that in a minute. So, as I, I, on, at first, you would think that Mars is as inhospitable as the Moon. And here's the Moon. And this photograph is of Apollo 15, so it's one of the later Moon missions. And as you can see, the Moon is actually quite an interesting place. And the very first missions went to rather uninteresting parts of the Moon, but it's got quite interesting geology and so forth. It's got lava tubes, rills, all sorts of things. It's even got some water uh, that you could extract about one kilogram per tonne of water in the uh, surface. And it's got ice, ice mixed in on the poles of the moon. Uh, however, it has been con pretty conclusively shown that there's no life on Mars on the moon just now and there never has been any life on the moon that is what we believe because the soil is so very very dry and there's no water available to, for life in the Mars soil and also from theories as to how the moon formed then we have both theoretical and observational reasons now since the lunar missions for believing that there is no life on the moon however and intriguingly, it's not completely impossible that there might be uh, dormant life on the Moon, not life that we introduced, but dormant life there. And this is from, uh, this is a fairly recent suggestion. And this is, would be, would have got there via gigantic impacts. So here is an artist's impression of the impact that uh, helped to bring an end to the dinosaurs. And here we've got pterodactyls in the, in the sky. And this size of impact, about 100 kilometers across, is just large enough to send debris into, the, into space at the edge of the crater as it's formed, surface, the surface of the, of the uh, body it impacts on is only lightly shocked 
and sent away at high speed. Uh, both simulations and kind of practical experiments using miniature uh, mock-ups of, of what is going on and this seems to be what would happen and it would if it's if the body is as large as 100 kilometers across then that's enough to send it with escape velocity through the thick earth atmosphere into space it's still quite a long way to get to mars and very few rocks would get there very quickly because most of it would end up in an earth orbit and we'd have to just do some flybys of earth before it eventually it maybe some of it a small proportion might eventually reach Mars. And so this process, it's quite difficult in recent times on Earth, but in the early times on Earth, the times there were, it's called the late heavy bombardment, confusingly, and the seas that you see on the Moon, these look like dark seas, and they are in fact molten lava from huge impacts by absolutely enormous uh, hundreds of kilometers across and, and larger meteorites that hit the moon. Well the same ones would have hit the earth at that time and they would have sent debris flying into space and this would have gone flying off into space and, and some of it could have reached Mars and a lot of it most likely reached the moon. So this is an intriguing possibility that there may be meteorites on the moon and they may be buried deep below the surface and the best preserved ones would be deep below the surface because they're protected from cosmic radiation. So we don't need to um, totally give up that actually the moon may be of some interest for the studying the evolution of life on, on Earth. However, this is all very recent stuff, and until recently, it was thought that the Moon was of no interest for the search of life and not inciting evolution, and our attention turned to Mars. Now, you might think this is a picture of the Moon. It looks just like the Moon, and this was the very first of the really decent photographs of the Moon were like this. It was, I think, Smariner 4, and these photographs were taken of the Martian highlands which the atmosphere is particularly thin and it's inhospitable area and it's just a cratered landscape very much like the moon. So this was very disappointing for people who were hoping to find evidence of life on Mars. So they continued to look though and the next idea was to send landers to Mars. Now uh, you might wonder why I've got James Lovelock here so he was actually involved in studying Mars uh, to see if it could be habitable before the Viking missions. Now, the, uh, Russia was actually the first to send landers to, the, to Mars, but they were very unsuccessful. Russia, Russia is actually the first country to have returned a sample from a celestial body to the Earth by purely robotic means, a remarkable achievement during the lunar missions on Moon. So they were a natural country to send the first rovers to Mars. But unfortunately, they were not nearly as successful on Mars as they were on the Moon. It's much trickier to land on Mars than to land on the Moon because of the thin atmosphere. And all their landers on the Moon, they failed. One of them lasted for 15 seconds. It sent back a single image on which there were no identifiable features, not even the horizon. So they were rather unfortunate, uh, the Russia. And then, um, so the states then stepped in after that, after Russia had pretty much given up. Then the states uh, uh, stepped in with, uh, and they came up with the Viking 1 and 2 rovers. And these were the first to actually land on Mars and to return significant data back from the surface. And before there was still some hope that they might find life on Mars because the Mariner 4 pictures, it was known these were taken in the uplands and it was thought the lower levels on Mars might be much more habitable. But James Lovelock, he's a very original scientist and he came up with this rather original argument saying that just from our observations on Earth, 
to deduce that there is no life on Mars. And he used observations that really we, we, we understand the atmosphere rather well, the composition of the atmosphere of Mars. You can tell it from the Earth by spectroscopic measurements and seeing how the light from the Sun reflected off the Earth, off the Mars surface, it tells you obviously the composition of Mars, but also by the way the dark lines in the spectrum are transformed as they go through the atmosphere, then you can, it also tells you things about the atmosphere of Mars. It's a somewhat more delicate observation than the, uh, than the surface of Mars, but even early in the 20th century it was possible to do these measurements and it was conclusively proved in a paper in 1924 that there is no oxygen on Mars to, uh, detectable and the, that we now know that, the, that from measuring on the surface there's a very very small amount of uh, neg uh, almost negligible amount of oxygen in the Martian atmosphere but for all practical purposes the atmosphere is just carbon dioxide. So James Lovelock, he uh, came up with this intriguing argument which really could have been done in the 1920s already, so this shows how original his idea was, is that looking at Mars and at the atmosphere and he observed that on the Earth life pushes the atmosphere out of equilibrium. And so if you had extensive vegetation, as they believed and uh, thought was still possible in the, then in the 1920s, then this should transform the atmosphere. And like photosynthesis, it produces oxygen as a byproduct. And life generally, it tends to push the atmosphere out of its equilibrium. So by looking at Mars and seeing there's only carbon dioxide there, and there's no oxygen, there's no methane, then there can't be uh, large quantities of life, so his argument went. Uh, there's a little bit more to the argument than just than that, because then the other thing is that if there was any life on Mars at all, then as the life tends to spread out and cover and go everywhere that is habitable. So he said if Mars is habitable, there won't be just little spots of life, the life would cover the planet, and here he is, so you see a picture of him, and I think, expect that's probably Gaia in the background, and the Earth Goddess, and the lush background of uh, an Earth. And if there's anything like that on Mars, then we, we, we would know, and we don't even need to send a spacecraft there, so he, so he argued. So already, before the Viking mission arrived on Mars, then scientists uh, were ready um, thought because of James Lovelock's argument that there probably is no life on Mars. So here is the Viking lander and that's uh, Carl Sagan standing next to a model. This is a model obviously on an Earth landscape and so this was the first lander to be sent to Mars that actually survived on the surface and it was dedicated to looking for life on Mars. Uh, and it had many experiments and they all, all except one, drew a blank and seemed to prove conclusively that there was no life on Mars and the Martian landscape it didn't, there was no visual signs of life at all. There was one experiment that bucked the trend and this is Gilbert Levin's experiment and he was, uh, it, it wasn't his fault, it was a very well designed experiment and if it had been anything like Earth life, then he would have detected, and even life that is not like Earth life. So the, that was the original thing about his experiment. It was able to detect life even just so long as it used um, organics and it could feed in a similar way to, to Earth life, but didn't need to have any DNA or in any way resemble Earth life. And his was the, perhaps the experiment that would be most capable of detecting alien life on the Viking and this came up with a very strong signal but the signal that it came up with was unfortunately one that didn't really match what you would expect life to do. So the Viking it was rather controversial and you got all the other experimenters and they look at their experiments and say there's no life on Mars 
and this one though that would have been most capable of detecting really alien life seemed to have a rather intriguing signal that nobody could explain. It didn't quite match life but it didn't quite match non-life either. It's in between the two. So Gilbert Levin, he uh, being the experimenter, he thought that it was life and he to this day still thinks that Viking detected life on Mars. And he came up with kind of semi-plausible reasons why it, to try and explain why you got this strange signal. And the, those, the other scientists, they, uh, they, they found it, they didn't have an adequate explanation of it. But they just said, there's, there's obviously something strange going on, but it doesn't look like life. And so, uh, so that was the situation, and the prevailing point of view was that this is not life. But Gilbert Levin came up with reasons which, uh, you know, scientific, scientifically acceptable, but rather what you call minority view science, and which uh, nobody else accepts except just one or two researchers. But it is still the scientific method. So, so that was uh, very disappointing, and I remember, you know, that was when I was, uh, I suppose, in my twenties or so, and uh, at that point, it really was very disappointing for those who want, who were hoping to find life on Mars, and it just seemed that the, the extremely unlikely that there is life on Mars, and then arguing back, you you would say, well, if there ever was life on Mars. Surely it would still be there. It wasn't understood quite in how inhospitable Mars was, and it was thought that maybe you know if there ever was life on Mars, well, surely it would still be there. We haven't detected it, so probably there's never been life on Mars. I think it was probably the prevailing the prevailing opinion there at, in those times. And, but then after that, we gradually hope began to rise again. And so now this is a discovery of life on the seabed, but it's not just the normal place in the seabed, it's deep, deep down. It's so deep in the seabed that it was thought that you couldn't really have prolific life there. This looks very much like the sort of life you would expect in fairly shallow seas. Very, you can see lots of different uh, life forms there, multicellular life forms. But this was too deep below the surface of the oceans to be using light in any way at all from the surface. And it turned out that these life forms, they were actually using hydrogen sulfide. And they were using the results of geochemical processes. It's uh, kind of like vented, gases vented from the surface, from the from the ocean floor. They, and, and it's what you, the term for this sort of thing nowadays is, it's called a, a closed ecosystem and it's, uh, it's not connected with the surface ecosystem. Well, this very first one discovered, it actually there is a connection because there's oxygen dissolved in the seawater and the multicellular life here actually uses oxygen so the multicellular life here indirectly depends on algae on the sea surface and on the plants on the land mainly the algae uh, producing the oxygen which then gets into the atmosphere and gets into the sea and then lets them grow but the single cell life down uh, on hydrothermal vents this doesn't need oxygen and it can do fine just on the hydrogen sulfide and it would be able to manage just fine anywhere where you have both water and hydrogen sulfide. So it doesn't need oxygen. So this was began to get the idea uh, developing that you could have uh, life forms, you could have ecosystem that is not connected to the surface of Mars and maybe deep down you, what if you have some ecosystem that is deep down, closed ecosystem, that has no communication with the atmosphere? Then that would be a way around James Lovelock's argument. And in fact, the, 
the, we got more promising th than these hydrothermal events, we eventually found microorganisms that live in the very, if you drill deep mine shafts in the Earth's surface, then you find life way down there, living in the rocks, living independently from the surface. And you even get uh, single species life forms that live down there. So single species ecosystem, there's only one species in the entire ecosystem. Uh, this discovery, I think, a South African mine. And so this brings rise to the possibility that you could have life like that on other planets and other places in the solar system. There may be several places, unfortunately not the moon, because it's thought to be extremely dry, even deep, deep down. You need water for this. But certainly on Mars, it's, uh, it's not known whether or not there is water so deep down, but it seems that it's certainly not impossible. And on Mars, to get the right combination of temperature and pressure, and you, you have the pressure of the rocks, so you don't need to worry about the thin atmosphere. If you go 10 kilometers down at the equator of Mars, then this may be habitable for microorganisms. It's about 15 kilometers when you get to the poles. So that is a, you know, hopes begin to rise, but it's a, going to be extremely difficult ever to, it's certainly not going to be in the near future, it's going to be decades into the future before we can hope to drill 10 kilometers down into Mars to find this life, if it is there. So it's, okay, but you make some progress. Uh, so next, the next thing that came up is the possibility, could there be life actually on the surface of Mars? And mainly the search is for past life, but if life did evolve on Mars in the past and it got as robust as Earth life, then it might still be there on the surface. And so how probable is that? Is that, is that possible? We know it's extremely cold, so here's Antarctica from space, and it's as, as cold as Antarctica, <coughs> but it's not covered in ice. And in Antarctica, although most of it is completely covered in ice, there are areas in Antarctica that this is actually, this photograph you might think, or oh, this might be you know, Iceland or Norway or somewhere like this, but this is actually a photograph of Antarctica. And the, uh, these are the McMurdo Dry Valleys in Antarctica. So, so there are certain places in Antarctica where the ice is kept free and it's extremely cold, and yet you still have ice on the, you, you still, it's extremely cold, but you don't have any ice there. And the, uh, this uh, very dry landscape is quite a good analogue for uh, Mars. And there is ice sort of below the surface, but not on the surface. The, Equatorial regions of Mars will be far drier than this. So this is an analogue for the high latitudes on Mars. And as bleak as it looks, you do actually get life in the McMurdo Valleys without surviving, without any water. And just on the, in these very dry uh, conditions, and these life forms, they live mainly, they're crypto they live underneath the surface of rocks. And they have extremely slow, long lifetimes. The longest live microorganisms on Earth, uh, uh, some of them live here. And they have lifetimes of thousands of years, so that's a single microorganism that can live for millennia. This makes them very difficult to study, of course, because it it's going to take a long time before they actually do anything. And you know, kind of, it's more like a kind of cross between archaeology and microbiology, studying life in the McMurdo Valley. And you look at the way the rocks flakes and evidence of different colours of the surface of rock to give you some idea of how the how these communities work that live beneath the rock surfaces in the McMurdo Valley. So this is a good analogue of life on, on Mars. 
if 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 there if there is life there, and in present day life, it would probably it might well be rather similar, and it might very well be very slowly metabolizing, very low populations, extremely difficult to study, and as you can imagine, most of Mars completely desert and just tiny this McMurdo Valley. If you trans, uh, the equivalent of that on Mars would be amongst the most habit habitable, the most hospitable areas of Mars. So when we talk about life on Mars, we're talking life very much on the edge, if there is life on present day Mars. So you can imagine that the effect of this on the atmosphere would be negligible and you would need very sensitive, extremely sensitive observations of the atmosphere to see any change in the atmosphere by a small population of thousand year lifetime microorganisms in in the higher latitudes and polar regions of Mars. So that's another way around James Lovelock's argument that it's not entirely conclusive. And but there's yet another. I, I think I'm now going to talk a little bit about some of the habitats on Mars where life could form, and there's some quite a lot of surprises. Now, I told you how dry it is in the equatorial regions on Mars. However. It's uh, surprisingly, this is a photograph taken by Viking. It's not very far from the equatorial regions. And this is the white on this photograph is frost. So you get frost in the morning and the evening regularly, even at the uh, low latitudes, even when you get close to the equator, you still get these frosts, uh, light frosts. And you might wonder, you know, how is that possible? And it's another mystery on Mars. But it, this ha we have found the answer to it. Why is it possible that when it's so dry that you could have uh, frosts forming? Well, the the answer is that the, although it's so dry there, the uh, dryness in the atmosphere is uh, the drying effect of the atmosphere is in the daytime mainly, and as it gets colder and at night, surprisingly. Um, as you may well know that when you have the same amount of water vapour in the air, as the air cools down, then the humidity increases because air can carry more uh, water vapour when it is hotter. So as it cools down, then the humidity increases without any more water vapour just because it's colder. And so in the evening and morning, you get 100% humidity in the Mars atmosphere. And so, literally, it's like a tropical rainforest, the humidity, uh, uh, that, except, of course, it's very, very thin, so there's not, nothing like the quantity of water, but there's the uh, possibility, that's why the water vapour condenses out, you reach 100% humidity, and condenses out onto the surface of Mars, and you form these frosts and these light frosts. And the, uh, just as in the uh, tropical rainforests, with the high humidity, you get uh, plants that just have these aerial roots, and they don't bother to use the soil, the roots just go into the air itself, and they're able to absorb water that way. Well, it's not so well known, but the same thing also happens on Earth in very cold climates, similar to Mars. And so in the permafrost regions of the Siberia and in the high Alps and places like that, you get these lichens and they are able to take up water vapour from the atmosphere when it's very cold and when you get this high humidity. It's very like the Mars conditions. And these lichens, they are also uh, they are surprisingly resistant to ultraviolet radiation. So on the surface of Mars, apart from we had the, uh, that it was so cold and so dry and the, and it's also got very thin atmosphere, you also, because of the thin atmosphere, you ha have uh, uh, very strong ultraviolet radiation, which is sterilizing for most life forms. 
and except of course when they're in shadow. But the these lichens they have melanin and a couple of other chemicals that are that only occur in lichens that are extremely good at shielding them from ultraviolet light. And so every cell has these these protective kind of coat that shields it from ultraviolet light. So what with it being able to do without any water and being resistant to ultraviolet light, it seems quite a good candidate. You know, would this what just let's try it out in a Mars simulation chamber and see what it does. And so that's what the uh, a group of scientists in the DLR, that's the German Aerospace, uh, they looked at, they decided to do this experiment and they pushed these lichens into Mars simulation chambers. Now these Mars simulation chambers, they are, uh, they're not, it's very difficult to simulate everything of the Mars uh, climate in a, in a chamber on Earth. You can't do the gravity obviously, but on uh, lucky that's not terribly important but you also have the uh, what's a big challenge is this extreme change from day to night and at the same time to keep the humidity and to keep the thin atmosphere and the ultraviolet light and for technical reasons it's difficult to keep all of, simulate all of those and and the so these simulations are gradually improving and getting better and better and the so they uh, did these simulations and they simulate the very thin atmosphere and the and the uh, cold conditions and the the sun the sunlight with the high ultraviolet levels it's not just one experiment it's an ongoing series of experiments and the surprising thing they find out is that this life it doesn't just survive on Mars it actually continues to grow and it photosynthesizes and it metabolizes uh, even the, in these extreme conditions and as far as we can tell it is growing normally. Of course lichen is extremely slow growing so you can only uh, you can't tell too much from a short experiment and so they're doing a series of ongoing series of experiments and uh, in these simulation chambers and they're trying out these lichens they're also trying out some algae that are extremely resistant in the same way. And they were also running these experiments in the chambers and also in the ISS. And so it's an ongoing thing, but the research so far uh, strongly suggests that this lichen would be able to survive on Mars just as it is, without any further adaptation needed. So that's quite remarkable. And this is almost anywhere on the surface of Mars. This is a very prevalent widespread habitat on Mars. Wherever these frosts form, then there's a chance that lichens, and so they could have some life forms that could, could form, could live almost anywhere on Mars. And then, so when you look at Mars, and we have these wonderfully high resolution images from orbit, we understand Mars very well from orbit, it's sub-meter resolution images. And you get these intriguing areas of Mars that look rather like, uh, they look, look like life. In fact, you might think that those are trees. Well, sadly, they are not trees. And the interesting thing in this picture, and, uh, well, first of all, to explain what those are, then they are Martian geysers. And they're a little bit different from Earth geysers. They don't send water into into the atmosphere, they send carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So it's dry ice turning into carbon dioxide and throwing stuff into the atmosphere. But it would probably throw lots of other stuff into the atmosphere. And it may well throw, it may well be that this, in some way water is involved in this process as well. <coughs> so that leads to the intriguing idea, could there be uh, life involved in this process as well as the obvious inorganic processes. And the so the thing of more interesting here, perhaps more these dark spots rather than these things that look like trees. But uh, these, uh, there, you get these spots on Mars and these 
some of them seem to grow seasonally and the uh, well, well the whole thing is a seasonal phenomenon but they the way that they they grow as as season progresses uh, looks somewhat reminiscent of life it could also be inorganic processes as well so this is decidedly speculative and it's really just because you've got the hope of the lichens then you come and look at this and you think could there be some life form that can actually grow on the surface of Mars and somehow be using these conditions here to grow seasonally the in the popular imagination you know it's they look at these and it looks very much like life and the other areas of Mars uh, look look very lifelike forms on the surface and Arthur C. Clarke he famously thought that some regions, some of these regions, he, not, not this particular region, that he thought that this was actually life on the surface of Mars and he thought multicellular life. And for various reasons, multicellular life does seem uh, rather unlikely because it took so long for multicellular life to evolve on the Earth. Talking about billions of years before it evolved from single to multi multicellular life. But uh, I suppose it's a remote possibility on on Mars and perhaps more likely if it if, if it did turn out to be anything to be some kind of colony of single cell life. But now if we look at this picture now this is a much more promising uh, possible habitat for life on Mars and these are the they're called the uh, recurrent slope linear so a bit of a uh, Last you can also call them warm seasonal flows and RSLs for short. And these, uh, as, they, as the name rather suggests, these these are thought not to be carbon dioxide ice. Now you have the, you have uh, gullies on Mars, so don't confuse these with the gullies. So there are things that just like just look like ordinary gullies on Mars, and these are thought to be uh, caused by dry ice and this is another seasonal thing that they form every year that you get these gullies that they form um, yearly thing they change from year to year but that's thought to be a dry ice phenomenon a bit like the geysers but this one is thought it doesn't seem to fit what you would expect from dry ice and to all uh, the, the most obvious way of interpreting it is that this is some form of uh, liquid and that it is probably maybe some very salty water but in some way it's flowing down the surface down under slopes and one way to understand that is maybe you have some subsurface aquifers that seasonally reduce, uh, release liquid and maybe 100 meters or so below the surface and they release liquid which flows down the slopes like that this is rather difficult to understand because the question the problem is that all this liquid is flowing down but there doesn't seem to be any mechanism to bring it back up again you know, there's no rain and it's difficult to see how the, this, the, these could be replenished they could be replenished maybe at times of high axi uh, of when the axial tilt high axial tilt of Mars but uh, and maybe some very slow process but it's, it's really quite hard to see how it's going to work you have you can sort of uh, you know, wave, wave your hands and say you know this and that but it's really hard to make it really work but we have had many surprises on Mars the many things we don't understand on Mars and it may well be that this is indeed what it seems to be some liquid and if so then it would be uh, uh, quite a reasonable habitat for life now this is yet another habitat from life and these are the uh, this is a ser serendipity it wasn't expected when the Phoenix lander and the Phoenix lander is the only lander to land anywhere near the polar regions uh, apart from Mars Polar Explorer which sadly crashed and it was so close to the pole that actually it's uh, as the as the winter progressed it's thought that Phoenix would have been covered by a meter th uh, thick layer of dry ice 
it was um, it was long it wasn't expected to survive the winter and it didn't so we don't have actual observation of that anyway when phoenix lander landed then it uh, some of the dust from the surface some of the soil from the surface was thrown up onto its legs and then surprisingly these uh, these things they form these droplets and as you can see they they gradually these droplets they gradually grew and you can see you can see in this picture you can see a uh, you know that uh, green one and it gradually it gradually eventually it falls off at that point and then you have this little one and you can see how it's growing and another thing you can't see because it's colored green but the the they start off light in color and they turn dark as they as they grow larger so you can see that's a large one it's really quite dark and the uh, this and then eventually it's thought that it fell off and we you know we don't have observation of it actually falling but it's gone so so the uh, the most obvious way of interpreting it it's a bit like the RSLs that the most obvious interpretation is it is not 100% accepted and the but the most obvious explanation of this is that these are salts that were thrown up from the surface salts in in uh, chemistry is a general term for anything that you get from a mixture of an acid and a base and so you have not just this ordinary sodium chloride but you have sulfates and you have sodium potassium you have many different compounds that are counted as salts so uh, uh, Phoenix it it made a surprising it discovered uh, that the soil was so rich in salts and particularly discovered magnesium perchlorate, which was a surprising discovery. And it's uh, and by the way, remember we were talking about the early uh, early labelled release and Gilbert Levin's thing. Well, the alternate explanation uh, to uh, Gilbert Levin's explanation is one that involves this magnesium perchlorate reacting with with um, organics. And so that was only a possible explanation after the discovery of it by Phoenix. Anyway, so so these these salts, they have the property that they're very much like the lichens that we saw earlier. They are able to take in uh, moisture from the atmosphere at times of high humidity, which, as we know, happens every evening and every morning. Uh, this is a process that is called deliquescence. So these uh, salts uh, in the soil, they would have taken in the moisture from the atmosphere and it gradually swells and becomes more and more liquid. And then finally, when it was swollen to its maximum, it fell, fell off. And you, there's quite a lot of evidence that this is what we are observing here, because you also had droplets that merged together and formed a single droplet. And really, it looks for all the world like drops of, drops of um, some form of liquid. And the way they form does look look like deliquescence. Uh, sadly we couldn't kind of properly examine them and so it's it has to remain as a kind of not fully confirmed yet. But in the biology experiments and looking at the salts that Phoenix found on the surface then it's supposed that you can also work out theoretically that it should happen that if you have the exact mixtures of salts. The problem is getting the right mixtures of salts. If you have the exact mixture of salts, then this process will happen. And you would have a daily cycle, and it goes through, and I hope I get this right, then it starts off with the ice frozen with the salts inside it. As it gets, as it warms up, then you get the ice melting. And it's called the eutectic limit which is, it's like a melting point, but when you have mixtures of many salts, then it's called the eutectic limit, which is when it turns into the liquid. Then as it gets, uh, warms up even more, then the liquid um, evaporates, and that's called efflorescence, when you've got salts, and you're left with just the salt. And then, as the cycle goes around, and as it cools down again, then you get deliquescence, which is when it takes in the moisture from the atmosphere, like the lichens did, and then finally, you get, it goes down to the eutectic limit again, and then it goes below it, still staying liquid. This is the process called supercooling. 
and so it's liquid for quite a long time during that phase and then eventually it will freeze again. So this process may be going on right now over much of the surface of Mars in little patches here and there wherever the, the concentrations of salts are exactly right. And this gives quite large droplets, which you're not talking about micron size, you're talking about millimetre scale uh, phenomenon. And it might even be millimetres, even get on for centimetres. You have little layers, thin layers of this in, in patches, like little thin, thin puddles below the surface of the soil. And it doesn't happen directly on the surface because it's too extreme there. You get these very high temperatures and very low temperatures and if there are salts there they will go straight to evaporating with with no real, real time for the kind of melting and they go straight uh, to there just won't be any very much time for for any liquid to form in this process as it cycles around and you get the if you are too deep below the surface then it is too cold for life so as far as we know the lowest temperature record for life actually being able to actually metabolize on Earth is minus 25 degrees centigrade. It's very low, but the, uh, magnesium perchlorate, for instance, it's, it's you take the limit as well, and, and it's deliquescing all that happens below that. So there may be liquid on Mars that is just too cold, at least for Earth life. And there may be liquids that are somewhat warmer and then there's also not just the temperature, there's also what they call the water activity, which is, tells you how available the water is for to life. And so if it's too salty, then water can't make any use of the, of the, of the life can't make any use of the water in the salts. So here we are, the, uh, so the, so it's, it's no means conclusive, we need more observations on the ground. But there's one intriguing thing, indirect observation that came out of the Phoenix lander again, but only after reanalyzing it later on. And this was examining the isotopic ratio, isotope ratios for carbon and oxygen in the CO2 in the atmosphere. And so this is a base, like a one spot observation and it's surprising how much the researchers managed to deduce from that. And they discovered from the carbon uh, isotope, ratio, isotope ratio that Mars must have been geologically active. The carbon dioxide must have come from volcanoes in the geologically recent past. So you're talking about like hundreds of thousands, millions of years. They didn't actually give a time period, but geologically recent past. But then they looked at the oxygen isotope ratio and this didn't match what you would predict to, for the, to match the carbon isotope ratio. This shows that the actual atoms of oxygen attached to carbon are not the same atoms that were attached to it when the carbon dioxide was produced by the volcanoes. So there were some eruptions on Mars that produced carbon dioxide gas and then the oxygen has somehow got exchanged with oxygen elsewhere on Mars. And the only really possible explanation of this that makes much sense is that it has interacted chemically with water on the surface of Mars. So this is indirect evidence that there must be liquid water on the surface of Mars in the geologically recent past. What they couldn't tell is whether this liquid water is a sort of one-off event that happens occasionally. So you have, for instance, the idea of impacts into the polar ice caps and the uh, and this could form liquid oceans that form briefly or liquids liquid lakes really that form briefly and then freeze over and there, there could be sort of short-term events or there could be that it's there all the time if it's there all the time it might be that this that what they were detecting was the liquid water of these uh, deliquescing salts, because this would be a sufficiently prevalent habitat over much of the surface of the of Mars, uh, just below the soil surface. Uh, that still doesn't tell us again whether it is sufficiently warm and whether the water activity is okay as well. So there's a lot to discover before we can know if this really is a habitat. 
on Mars, but it's a potential, it's a possibility. And intriguingly, I was talking about the impacts on the polar ice cap, that those also, they are a possible habitat. So if you get a big meteorite that impacts on the polar ice caps, this would melt the ice caps to form a, a, a lake, and the surface of the lake would very quickly freeze over. But this then acts as a protective layer which prevents the water from evaporating in the thin atmosphere. And so it turns out, if you model it, that if you have a really big impact on the polar regions of Mars, then you can get these lakes and they can persist, persist for millennia. So long enough for life to do some really interesting stuff in these, in these polar lakes, frozen over polar lakes. And there might even be life there all the time in the polar regions. And again, this is a very surprising suggestion, but you have something that is called the solid state greenhouse effect. So we are well aware of the atmospheric greenhouse effect, which, which keeps, the, uh, keeps the heat in, in, in to, in, because of the atmosphere, uh, that the high grade heat goes in and then the Low, low wavelength infrared heat can't escape through the atmosphere so easily and so it gets trapped. Well, the same thing happens, uh, not so well known, in, in, when you have layers of ice or snow and it can form, you can get a thin liquid layer forms below this as a result of the greenhouse effect of the ice. And then you have soil or something or some rock below that and get a thin liquid layer forming there. So that same process could happen on Mars as well. And even in the polar regions, you could have either dry ice or ordinary ice could, through the solid state greenhouse effect, have a thin habitable layer just at the bottom of the ice. So that's another possible habitat. And then you could, and then, you, and then if, the, if it's life is there already, especially, then if you get impacts causing temporary lakes, then the life could, could, could really flourish in those lakes. So, uh, so there are quite a lot of habitats on and near the surface of, of Mars. Uh, the, also, I, I mentioned the trapped ice layers that may exist in the equatorial regions. If we're lucky, they may be, they may be habitats. The subsurface aquifers uh, that, that cause the warm seasonal flows then if, if they are liquid all the time, maybe geothermally heated, that's another possibility. The, uh, and uh, we've got the very deep subsurface, and there's also possibility if you have specks of dust in the snow, then the, the sunlight can heat this up. Uh, another possible habitat is that the just a bit like the solid state greenhouse, but if you have the, sorry, uh, another possible habitat is in the soil. A very thin layer of soil is able to filter out UV radiation and yet let enough light through for photosynthesizing. So even light that is not particularly hardy against ultraviolet light could survive just below, could photosynthesize just below the surface of the soil. Another habitat is uh, trans, trans uh, translucent rocks and, and beneath those you could get photosynthesizing uh, uh, life forms in beneath rocks in and and uh, there are several other possibilities as well you, you can read my article might there be microbes on the surface of Mars uh, uh, perhaps I won't go through everything just now so so now the question arises is why did the um, is uh, why don't we just send a lander to go and look at these habitats? And so that's why I've got this picture. This is the landing ellipse for curiosity. And I put that there to show that the, uh, show, show why it is so difficult to target specific regions on Mars. If you're sending a mission to the moon with modern technology, you could pinpoint accuracy landing, but it's much harder with the Mars because of the atmosphere and, and of course, also of course of the extreme distance and the communication delay, light speed com communications delay and the atmosphere, it's just enough of the atmosphere to be a problem. It heats, it causing heat and 
and it's not enough to just parachute down to the surface and it makes it very difficult to accurately target the surface of Mars. And curiosity, uh, to give it a sense of scale, that's Mount Sharp in the background and that has a height of 18,000 feet, so about three miles. And this is the landing ellipse of Curiosity. And it only just was able to fit between Mount Sharp and the crater walls in order to be able to land safely. And Curiosity is much more accurately targeted than any previous mission to Mars, to the Mars surface. So this is, uh, previous ones could not, could not have landed uh, in Gale Crater. Curiosity is the very first mission to have landed there. But we're talking about much more difficult places to target for most of these really interesting habitats. So that's one of the reasons. And another reason is because of the difficulty of sterilising our spacecraft. So the uh, Viking spacecraft, they were heat sterilised for 30 hours at 145 degrees centigrade. And modern electronics they would go out of alignment and the thin layers that constitute them would evaporate. And for one reason or another, if you would take a modern spacecraft and heat it in the same way you did Viking, it simply wouldn't be a functioning spacecraft anymore at the end of that process. Uh, however, so, so at, at present, right now, the, well, at the time of Curiosity, there wasn't really technology to sterilize Curiosity to go to any of the really interesting regions anyway for present day life. And NASA, with some urgency, has been trying to... You have to certify. So we did actually have technology that could have worked, but you have to prove that it will work. So the technology that has finally been certified is nearly... It's on the process being certified. The procedure has been worked out. And it just is basically going through the official tape, as it were. The It hasn't quite been certified yet. Is using low vapor pressure hydrogen peroxide. And... This is a medical tech use in medicine and it's been approved for future spacecraft to Mars. It's in the process of being approved. So in future, we may be able to sterilize them sufficiently to go to these interesting regions. So these are two regions, reasons why we haven't been able to look at them close up. And then there's also the problem, that even if you do look at them close up, you will need extremely delicate instruments to find the life because it is expected that it's, it is at very, very low concentrations. You're not talking about anything like earth soil or anything like that, but much more like the McMurdo valleys or even thinner concentrations. And then the other thing is that now, oh yes, here we are, axial tilt. The other thing is that maybe not all these habitats are actually inhabited. So this shows how the axial tilt of Mars varies as the varies. We're going back in time. And Mars is extremely variable axial, axial tilt. And it's chaotic. It hasn't got the moon to stabilise it. And it's chaotic in the technical sense that very small differences can change, the, change it long term. So you can't predict it long term. Uh, and it, uh, as you see, it varies between 20 degrees and 50 degrees. So at 20 degrees, then it's, uh, you get these large polar ice caps. This is where we are just now. And then this is 50 degrees, when it tilts so far that the poles actually get more uh, sunlight during the year than the equator does. And so you get this rather intriguing phenomenon then of equatorial ice sheets. And there's an equatorial ice sheet shown on that, on that picture. Anyway, the most habitable time on Mars is during the periods when the, ax the axial tilt is high because then the polar ice caps, they entirely evaporate and the atmosphere is somewhat thicker and you might possibly get liquid water actually able to, to have actually standing water on the surface of Mars uh, in those, at those times and it, the habitable regions would spread out over much more of the habitat and at the moment we are in a much less habitable time when probably all the habitats, if there is life on Mars, would be shrinking back and, and there's much smaller regions that are habitable. And it's very difficult 
for life to spread around on the surface of Mars. So in the case of Earth, you've got birds, you've got insects, you've got the winds, which can carry things very easily around on the surface of Earth. You've got water, streams, and it's very easy for, for life to be carried around all over the surface of Mars, and particularly microorganisms could be carried almost anywhere on the surface of Mars, and they go up to, of, of Earth, right up the stratosphere and so on. The process on Mars is probably much harder for life to find its way around, because remember, if it goes right up the stratosphere, you've got the ultraviolet light, extremely sterilizing. And perhaps if, in terms of global distribution, the easiest way would be if it gets embedded in a dust grain, because the dust grain being iron oxide and in the dust storms would give some protection from the ultraviolet light. And the, uh, and some life forms might actually be able to be resistant to ultraviolet light, but one way or another, there's not very many vectors to spread them around on the surface. So maybe only habitats that are close to each other manage to infect each other, and maybe it's a very long process, especially given that these uh, microorganisms may only reproduce every few millennia as well. So it may be that some of these temporary habitats, and then you also have the cosmic ra radiation, which sterilize the surface over tens or hundreds of thousands of years. So uh, if you have a habitat that just sort of dries out, and then it becomes habitable again, and if it's 100,000 years later, that's too late. Even though certain sp uh, spores on Earth would be able to survive that long, they would be sterilized by then. So, the, so that makes Mars quite a, a bit of a challenge for spreading around. So it's possible if it is habitable and if there is life there, then some of the habitats may be inhabited and some of them may not be inhabited. So we may not find life on the, in the very first promising place that we look for it, even if it is habitable. And so this is quite an important thing to bear in mind in the future. If you get a rover that does manage to look at the potential habitat on Mars, and it looks like a habitat and there's no life there, if this was Earth, you would conclude immediately that there can't be any life on Mars because life spreads around Earth so easily that within a, within a few years, that it would definitely be inhabited. But that's not the same on Mars. And you can't deduce that just because it's habitable that it must get inhabited by any life that there is on Mars. So it's a real challenge to look for life on the surface. And it, now I want to look at, at, at why it's a challenge for to look for life in the past on Mars. So I'm going back a bit. And as you go further back in the past, you have this period, and this is uh, showing river channels, uh, again orbital photographs of Mars with, and you see it looks very much like river channels. To start with, this was highly controversial, because remember the search for life for water on Mars, which occupied several decades. And quite early on, they observed these features, but it wasn't conclusive that it was water, because there were certain things you know, some of them are a little bit too short and stubby for water, and they, and, and as we now know, some of the phenomena were actually created by carbon dioxide, uh, by dry ice rather than water. So it's a mixture of water features and dry ice features, and it took quite a while to disentangle all that, and to prove conclusively that this is water. And especially when we were able to land rovers on the surface, that we were able to travel around on the surface, then these managed finally to show conclusively that what we are looking at here are, and so these are river channels. We, are, we can say with some measure of certainty that this is an aerial photograph of river channels on Mars. But we know that rivers can't flow on Mars at present, and we think even when the actual tilt is, is at its highest, you could have some standing water, but you couldn't have extensive river channels like this. It seems very unlikely, because you, you, you know, you'd need rain or very heavy snowfall, you'd need a really massive circulation of water around in the atmosphere. And then you look at them, and they are very ancient. Uh, so I think my next picture, yes, here we are. This is a picture, a close-up 3D, there's a 3D stereo imaging camera. It's on the Mars Express, I think, that's taking this photograph, and it lets you do and then you can rotate them around in the computer and look at different angles. And this is a river, and you see quite a large river, and this is from the 
Hesperian period. So we have this evidence from the rivers that there was a period when there were great floods on Mars. And these floods, it's not very well understood again. So yet one more thing that we don't really know, nobody knows really uh, why these floods happened. But they may be subsurface aquifers, like the ones maybe that, that possibly could have caused these warm seasonal flows. Uh, but uh, the release is a bit, if, that, if so, it would be a process a little bit like the warm seasonal flows, but on a much larger scale. And you just get a huge flood of water that, uh, that uh, fills, uh, reasons not, not fully understood, you suddenly get a flood of this water and it, and it fills one crater after another. You can look at the cratering record. So the, the craters, these large and small craters, if you look at them carefully, you get an idea of the relative time scale. And so you can see that these floods fill one crater after another. So, so that's the period of floods, and it's the Hesperian period on Mars. And so this was quite habitable. And if there was life that was evolved, then surely it was around during the Hesper Hesperian period. Uh, but it was quite a hard period for life to actually evolve in. So as long as we only had evidence of these, these rivers, well, we don't know. I mean, maybe it was possible, uh, but uh, it just, there was a, uh, just that the floods are much smaller than the Earth oceans. So on Earth, you've got these huge oceans and there's no flood going on. And generally, they tend to think in terms of evolution as, as when you have seas, rather during this kind of flooding period. Uh, I suppose it could have been evolution during the flooding period as well, uh, come to think of it. But uh, the, the still was a bit of a puzzle, you know, how would life evolve on Mars? And it was really when they saw the evidence of seas on Mars that it really began to seem very promising that life, life could have evolved on Mars. And uh, so this is going even further back. And this is the very recent, this is July of this year, um, this, the, this, this evidence. The one on the right is a Russian delta, the one on the left is a Mars photograph. And because you've got this very fine measurements of the topography, you can tell which direction it is. And it's definitely a delta and not tributaries. And then you see this evidence to the you see the evidence to the right there that it looks as if it's going down off a kind of a shelf and this is apparently indicative of it being going into a sea or a very large body of water and then if you look at what it's going into it was it is draining into uh, a very large area in, in fact it's the entire a scenario a low area that covers the entire uh, much of the northern hemisphere of Mars about a third of the surface area of Mars is low-lying and this delta is draining into it. So this is now fairly conclusively established that that was a sea. When it was first discovered it was much more controversial because the they found this evidence of a coastline going all the way around this sea and it looked very much like a coastline and with features like deltas going into it and so on and a coastline going all the way around the surface around the sea, but it uh, seemed not to be all of the level. So that was a little bit, so in one way it was very convincing that it must be a seashore, but in another way, but but maybe it's, could it possibly be something else, because it didn't seem to be all of the level. But luckily that was resolved, because they uh, found out by looking at polar wonder and way that this, the shape of uh, Mars has changed, then you find that by undoing the effect of that, going back in time, that it would originally have been all of one level. So it's now believed that there's a sea covering the entire northern hemisphere of Mars. And this is the this is the, that sea. This is a, re, a reconstruction of what it would have looked like. This is looking from the North Pole, so it's a rather unfamiliar viewpoint on Mars. And I think this might, I'm not sure if this is the first sea or the second sea, because there were two seas. There's evidence of two seas, one after the other. And the very first sea was the one that lasted the longest, and this lasted for hundreds of millions of years. Then you had a period of floods, 
and then about a billion years later we are pretty sure there was a second sea that formed. And then finally Mars went into the deep freeze as it, that it is now. So uh, this is all very exciting for, uh, for evolution because first of all these seas make it very likely that evolution could have got started on early Mars and then the later on the Mars went into a deep freeze and this means that the deposits, the layers from the early seas and especially the floods from later on, these may have, some of them may have gone very quickly into a deep freeze and so that in these deep freeze conditions then the, the life would be uh, preserved. You may have heard of the mammoths, on preservation of mammoths in, in Siberia is the way it happens. And because the mammoths lived in such a very cold place, then the, they are much more exquisitely preserved than anything else we have from that time. You can even see some of them even have hair, so this wonderfully preserved baby mammoth with, you can see that they had red hair. So we now don't know that the mammoths were redheads. And the, uh, you can look at their stomach contents and everything. So they're wonderfully preserved because it was so cold. And it stayed cold ever since. Well, the same thing is true of early Mars. So if there was any life on the early Mars, and also proto-life, whatever there was there, then uh, some of it could have gone straight into a deep freeze, just like the mammoths. And because there has been absolutely no continental drift except just the very start of it, so you know the Valles Marineris, this uh, Marineris, this uh, may be the very beginning of a rift valley on Mars. It looks very like it. So continental drift just got off to a start, but it didn't really manage to get fully underway. So as a result, these deposits, they haven't been subducted, they haven't been metamorphosed, they should be just sitting there, pristine deposits. And some of them would have been covered up very quickly by the flood, by the flood, by the, these massive floods. And these would be most interesting because of the cosmic radiation degradation, which I talked about before. And by the cosmic radiation is, uh, these are highly energetic particles and they come from elsewhere in our galaxy and some of them possibly intergalactic. And they're very, very high energy and they can pen penetrate deep beneath the surface of Mars and they come from all directions. So there's no protecting from them, unlike things from the sun. And the, these, uh, this cosmic radiation over hundreds of thousands of years it will degrade uh, DNA, it will degrade all organics, and it would thoroughly sterilize and degrade any organics in the top uh, 10 meters or so of the surface. So for instance, curios curiosity isn't really expecting to find pristine uh, life. It, it couldn't detect it anyway. It's only using looking for organics, but if it did find anything, it wouldn't be pristine if it's from this, this far back unless you're extremely lucky and you get a meteorite impact that throws up deposits from early Mars onto the surface and it's done that recently enough. So maybe we'll strike it lucky somewhere on Mars and find something like that. But apart from that, you're having to drill at least 10 meters below the surface. And in order to find these deposits, you also are looking for, in order for it to be preserved in these particular conditions and the conditions that preserve organics and would preserve indeed entire microorganisms with exquisite preservation from back then would be like clays and sulfates are wonderful for preserving organics. And if we could find the, uh, a clay or, or sulfates from that time, which is just going to a deep freeze, you know, maybe four billion years ago or however long ago on Mars, and it's been there ever since, and it's managed to remain, and it got covered very deep very quickly over geological time scale to a depth of at least 10 meters and then it stayed there ever since then that could be pristine evidence of very early Mars or very early stages of evolution and we have absolutely nothing like it on Earth and, but the only other place where we could hope to find 
evidence like that would be these these ones that got this uh, meteorite evidence that could have got thrown up onto the moon by the early impacts. But the Mars is better conditions and it's also on Mars the uh, it could have been an independent evolution from Earth. Anyway, I, so I'm, I'm certainly drawing towards the end of this. I don't want to talk too much more. We can talk about this in other talks, some of these issues that have been raised. But hopefully, and, and to try and understand the alternative forms of life that couldn't... I think maybe that would be the next thing to talk about, is some of the early alternative forms of life that there could be on Mars, and how easy or difficult it might be to understand what happened there. And, what it, and how much that would tell us about evolution on, on Earth. But anyway, this is hopefully enough to understand why it is so difficult to find out about life on, on Mars, and why to this day we, nobody knows if there ever was life on Mars, and nobody knows if there is life on Mars. The past life on Mars, it is, if it is there, then the evidence may be there, but it's at least 10 meters below the surface unless we are very very lucky and we find other, another way of finding of getting down there by the way is not just it being thrown up but there's also caves uh, you may know of have uh, heard of the martian caves that have been photographed from orbit and these black holes in the surface these are not so interesting for past life because these are holes in into lava tubes so it's not a very likely place to find evidence from from this far back of, of what life was like then. But there are other possibilities of caves on Mars, and these wouldn't be so easy to spot from orbit. You wouldn't be able to spot them from orbit. And these are caves that would be formed by water dissolving clays and sulphates. In fact, the very places, very kind of deposits, and other kind of, other kind of soft deposits from this ancient time. And so you could have had later just streams not, not the big floods. You have a big flood, it creates a great deposit, and then you have later streams that flow through this, and they would wear away some of the deposits, and they might wear away deep down below the reach of cosmic radiation, and you might be able to do speleology on Mars with your rovers, have tiny rovers that can go into other surface caves on Mars once we are able to uh, uh, explore it thoroughly on the surface. And so that's another way where you might need to actually drill below the surface and you might actually be able to go down and find these deposits through robotic speleology. You don't want to send humans anywhere near this stuff because you, uh, you uh, just one DNA molecule or one amino acid would be enough to confuse our sensitive observations. Anyway, that's another thing I'll talk about uh, separately in a different talk. But so, so there is certainly lots of promise to find out loads of, it's a very, very exciting place to explore. And either there may be life there, or there may be, it'd be very surprising if there's no life there. I for, forgot to say, but the early oceans, the uh, comets and whatever delivered the water to the surface of Mars, it would also brought organics. And these organics include amino acids and also indeed uh, the basis for DNA, including alternative bases that aren't used in present day DNA. And all this would be brought to the surface of early Mars and it, it could have been used for evolution. So as far as we know, and probably for the start of life, anyway I'll talk about this in the next talk, that the, uh, as to, as to you know, the potential of early, early Mars for evolution. We're getting to I'm going to stop this at 90 minutes, because I think 90 minutes is plenty long enough for a talk. And But I, I have managed to go through all the things I wanted to talk about. So, so I be. if you've got any comments, please please do say if you've got any comments or questions, any particular things that you would like me to, to uh, uh, talk about. And you might like to read my articles on science20.com I will put links in the comments so I have these articles and this is actually what what encouraged me to start this video channel was because of these articles and the interest and the amount of interest that I got and particularly the most recent one which is called 10 reasons not to live on Mars great place to explore 
that has led to a lot of attention. So you may well find that interesting if you haven't seen it. And then uh, particularly relevant to what we've been talking about now, the various ones like might there be microbes on the surface of Mars and the value of pristine Mars and the various other ones. And I'll put those into the links if, if you haven't seen these yet. And so thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed this talk and uh, the more to come and uh, uh, especially if I get uh, in, 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 interested enthusiastic feedback. And to, uh, if any of you are experts on this, I am well aware I'm a mathematician by training, music and software developer and a mathematician. And I've been interested in astronomy and following it. I'm an, like an armchair, very keen armchair amateur astronomer, been following it since I was a child when I was in the, in the 70s and in the 60s. But I'm well aware I'm not an expert in these different areas that I've been talking about. So if there's, if there's anything, I've done my very best and as far as I know what I've described here is, is, the, is accurately represents the, and, and I haven't introduced, I do have some wild ideas of my own, but what I've been talking about here is established stuff. It's not, it's not wild ideas. And it's, uh, I will clearly mark if I, if I say anything that is my own ideas, then I will, I'll, I'll make that very clear. And so, so, uh, but, but if, if, if I have, if there's anything that I've, I've got wrong, do please correct me as well. For those of you who are, who are experts, I know like some of my Facebook friends who are expert exobiologists and so on, do please correct me, anyone, anywhere if there's anything that I've said that isn't quite right. So thanks for listening and, and, uh, and here and, and can expect to hear more later and I really look forward to any comments and any questions you have and suggestions.